We'll take you live to our nation's capital now. That is where industry minister Francois-Philippe Champagne, in fact, and Sean Fraser, Minister Sean Fraser, um, also speaking uh, to the press on grocery uh, prices. Let's listen in. The measures included in the fall economic statement, which represent the latest uh, efforts to uh, uh, put policies in place that are going to help build more homes. Um, there's measures designed to uh, build more homes more quickly. There's measures designed to unlock supply that exists in the market today. There's some relief for people who are dealing with higher interest rates as a result of uh, changes to their monthly mortgage payments. And there's a systemic change within government uh, that I'd like to discuss around uh, the operations that will allow us to better mirror uh, uh, or better tie together um, the housing policies with our infrastructure policies. Uh, so first, on addressing the challenge that uh, we need to, uh, to to build more homes, uh, there are several direct measures in place that are going to help uh, finance the construction of, of housing in this country. Uh, the first is changes uh, to the apartment construction loan program. Uh, this is a program that operates by allowing the federal government to pass on a low borrowing rate that we benefit from in exchange for commitments from home builders who offer apartments at prices at and below what the market will actually bear. Uh, there's an additional $15 billion that are, uh, that are going to recapitalize this program, uh, which continues to operate with money that was already in the system. Just uh, to demonstrate that this program is having success, the week before last, uh, we rolled out more than $4 billion worth of loans that's going to result in the construction of almost 12,000 homes across this country. These are real projects, real buildings that are going to provide real homes for families, and the agreements are done and moving forward. We're going to continue to be able to issue more of these low-cost cost loans to builders to build homes more quickly uh, for a long time into the future with an additional $15 billion behind the program. Um, in addition to the low-cost financing uh, program that we've created, we have an opportunity to continue to invest directly in the construction of affordable housing to support low-income families. Uh, my view is your uh, opportunity to have a roof over your head should not depend uh, on whether you can afford a place in the market. Uh, the national housing strategy was built around the idea that we can be subsidizing directly the construction of affordable homes for low-income families. Families. And to see an additional billion dollars injected into our program signals that we're going to continue to be making the investments necessary to build non-market housing stock in this country. But it's not enough for us to continue to put policies in place that will be future-oriented, though we must absolutely do that. Uh, there are things we can do in the short term to unlock supply that exists today. Uh, there's new measures that the finance minister has uh, put in place around short-term rentals. Uh, think about Airbnb, for example. Uh, the measures that we're putting in place involve changes to the tax system that are going to deny tax advantages to people who don't follow the rules within their municipalities or provincial governments. And funding that's put in place, $50 million to help with the enforcement of those rules at a municipal level. What we've seen in jurisdictions that have tried this is a remarkable remarkable degree of success extremely quickly. Uh, New York is one of the leading examples globally where they had 22,000 units on the market and a little more than a month later after they put new measures in place, uh, 19,000 of those 22 actually found their way onto the market for families to rent. Uh, my view in a housing crisis is that if a municipality determines uh, that you have an opportunity to put homes on the market for families to rent for the long term, uh, then you should do that instead of making them available for a few days at a time. Uh, um, also, still I, I, to bounce back, so my, my apologies for uh, uh, skipping over something important. Um, cooperative housing provides an opportunity over and above the affordable housing programs we have to continue to put homes on the market at prices that families can afford at different income levels. Uh, we're going to be moving forward with the uh, in excess of $300 million we previously committed to earlier in the new year and are making a change to the uh, policy around the GST break that we're giving for new apartment construction by including cooperative housing developments in that program as well. Uh, we anticipate uh, that this is going to expand construction of cooperative housing, uh, which uh, provides homes at, at reasonable prices for families, including a number of our colleagues who uh, are representing their communities in Parliament today uh, that are very proud to have grow up, grown up in co-op housing. Um, we also know that people are struggling with the rising rate of interest given the impact it has on their monthly mortgage bills. Uh, the mortgage charter takes a series of rules and puts them in a single place so consumers actually know what they can be asking their financial institutions for. Uh, by uh, going to your bank if you're in a, a distressed borrowing situation to ask for an extended amortization period, for example, that provides an opportunity for you to reduce your monthly payment. By uh, dealing with uh, additional competition on the market at the time of your renewal, uh, we believe that it's going to create an ecosystem 
ecosystem where uh, competition will bring out the best offer for borrowers. By changing a series of rules, uh, or rather putting a series of rules in place uh, in a single place for consumers to have access to, they're going to know what they can ask their bank for. My sense is there's a number of, uh, of people who would love to have an opportunity to pursue some of the relief outlined in the mortgage charter that simply don't know that these are options for them. And by drawing attention to what consumers can ask for and what we expect financial institutions to offer, we can provide relief for people who are renewing their mortgage or perhaps who have a variable rate mortgage now, given the rapid changes to the rate of interest that exists in the economy. Um, the last change baked into the fall economic statement I wanted to discuss, uh, which I'm actually very excited about, is the formal merger, merger of our housing and infrastructure work within the federal government bureaucracy. By collapsing housing and infrastructure into a single department, we're going to be able to better identify and adopt policies that will allow us to use our infrastructure investments to build more homes and ensure that our housing policies are designed with the vision of a complete community. It's not enough for us to build homes to act as storage units for people. Uh, we want them to be able to live and thrive in complete communities. And by marrying these two departments together into a single uh, a department, we'll be able to achieve that. Uh, and if I uh, may take 20 more seconds, I wanted to provide a brief update on the rollout of the Housing Accelerator Fund. Uh, as of yesterday, we've signed an uh, agreement with the municipality of Richmond Hill. Uh, this makes uh, 11 agreements uh, since September that we've signed. Uh, and according to the projections, not of the federal government, but directly from our partners uh, who signed these agreements with us, uh, we are now, uh, over the next 10 years, expecting to see uh, the Housing Accelerator Fund uh, lead to an additional 250,000. Uh, units. Uh, this is a policy that we've been rolling out just in the last few months. It's having a bigger impact than I expected, and I had very high expectations going in. Uh, what's exciting for me is the changes being made at a municipal level are going to have an impact in perpetuity. The systemic reforms are going to make it easier to build homes and to build the kinds of homes that will allow us to overcome the national housing crisis. I want to say thank you to the Finance Minister for bringing such a focus to housing in the fall economic statement. This latest suite of measures is going to make a meaningful difference and have an impact in the short term. Uh, with that, I'll hand the stage over to my colleague, Minister Anand. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, nous continuons de travailler pour uh, notre population canadienne. Continuing to work for Canadians and for our economy. We have a very high credit report and a very low unemployment rate. Canadians continue to feel the impacts of high interest rates and inflation. Through the fall economic statement, we're striking the balance between fiscal responsibility, that track that we are on, as well as being there to support Canadians every step of the way, just as we did in the pandemic. Over the past couple years alone, we've taken some very important steps. Uh, for example, $10 a day childcare. That has actually led to record labour market participation of 85.7 per cent among women aged 25 to 54 years old. We're also helping over 380,000 children get the dental care they need through the Canada Dental Benefit while working towards a long-term Canadian dental care program. So those are some of the measures that we're going to continue to focus on as a government. And the gist is that we are focused on making life more affordable in every aspect of everyday life, whether it is in housing, whether it is in groceries, or whether it is in health care. Today, in that vein, I want to focus on junk fees. Depuis 2016, nous avons pris des mesures. We have been bringing in measures to limit these fees that cause stress. January 2020, the CRTC Internet Code made it easier for Canadians to understand their Internet service contracts to prevent bill shock from overage fees and price increases. June 2022, nous avons annoncé des modifications au... We've announced changes to the consumer protection rules so that Canadians can avoid surprise fees. But we're not stopping there, and we will continue to take action to reduce junk fees, as outlined in the fall economic statement. 
Right now, while most airlines will try to seat you in proximity to your child who is between 5 and 14 years old, it's not a guarantee. To guarantee that your child over 5 can sit next to you, you have to pay for seat selection. Standard seat selection for airlines can cost up to $60 per ticket for domestic travel, which can quickly add up to being nearly $100 or more just for a round trip for a family of four with two kids under 14. At this economic time, parents are experiencing the financial burden and frustration of deciding between saving some money or making sure their seven-year-old can sit next to them on their flight. That is why, in the fall economic statement, our government is seeking to ensure that airlines seat all children under the age of 14 next to their accompanying adult at no extra cost. Notre gouvernement s'est engagé. Our government is committed to working with the Transportation Agency of Canada in order to amend the Air Consumers Protection Act so that airlines ensure that they seat children under the age of 14 next to their uh, accompanying adults. And another sort of junk fee, and that is non-sufficient fund fees charged by banks, or the NSF fees, that you may have experienced. These fees, which can currently be as high as $50, with no limit to how many times they can be applied, disproportionately impact Canadians with low income or those who may not have access to overdraft protection due to their credit history. In an age where automated withdrawals are so frequently used for paying bills, Canadians should not have to carry the additional burden of worrying about an extra $50 that will come out of their account if their payment for their hydro bill does not go through. In December 2021, I want to point to an example from the United States where the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau released a report on the banking industry's excessive and unfair reliance on banking junk fees. Since then, 15 of their 20 largest banks have ended the practice of charging NSF fees. We would like to see Canadian financial institutions respond in a similar way. Nous voulons que nos banques fassent... We want our banks to do the same and to get rid of those fees. All right, that's the federal government providing an update on affordi affordability measures for Canadians in Ottawa there. You've been listening to Minister Anita Anand. We're going to take you back to Ottawa now, where Deputy Prime Minister Christopher Freeland is talking about affordi affordability measures. Let's listen in live. More on public debt charges than we're spending on health care. How can you justify that? High interest rates are a challenge for the whole world, and they are a challenge for every single person in Canada. And that is precisely why our government is so focused on an economic plan, which allows us to make the necessary investments in Canada and Canadians, and also creates the conditions, the ma helps to create the macroeconomic conditions, which will make it possible for us all to return to a more normal macroeconomic environment. That's what we're focused on. Nigel Malis, the Canadian Press. Hi. Um, following up on, on Mackenzie's questions, um, Mr. Fraser, you've talked a lot about the homelessness crisis and you've spoken passionately about it. Um, communities are seeing tent cities when they weren't used to it. Um, we also have lagging social housing in the country compared to the OECD average. Um, given the new restri restrictions on deficit spending that is in the fall economic statement, uh, are you telling Canadians that you will not be able to tackle those kinds of big, big problems that they're facing? Uh, and if you are planning on tackling it, how will you do that? Is it higher taxes? Is it pushing provinces to spend more? What's your plan? Uh, thanks very much, and uh, I'll do my best to give you a quick answer so we can make time for more questions. But but please uh, please know this is a complicated subject that will take time to dig in uh, appropriately. Uh, so the short answer to your question is uh, that 
we are absolutely not signaling we're not going to invest in housing because there are restrictions around being responsible from a fiscal point of view. Uh, in fact, the very document that identifies the uh, fiscal responsibility measures you're pointing to is also investing in excess of $16 billion to build more housing in Canada. And I think that's a proof point that we both want to build housing but operate within a sustainable fiscal framework as well. In order to actually overcome uh, the challenges around homelessness, around the deficit in social housing, you have to understand that the challenges that we're living with today were 30 years in the making, starting in the late 80s, certainly in the early 90s, under both Liberal and Conservative governments. Decisions were taken by federal governments not to invest in affordable housing. Homelessness doesn't exist because of a person's ancestry. It doesn't exist because people live with mental illness. It's not just a factor of poverty. Homelessness exists because there's not enough affordable housing in communities. Nobody chooses to be homeless. Nobody chooses to live in a shelter. Okay, by making several federal ministers time, in Ottawa talking about affordability on. measures to help Canadians in this economy as they relate to housing, grocery prices, a national dental care program, and much more.